Spinal cord nerves and reflexes. We're going to talk about today the spinal cord, the nerves that come off the spinal cord, as well as reflexes that include those nerves coming through the spinal cord and going back out. As well as reflexes, which utilize the sensory nerve to the spinal cord, through the spinal cord and back out to the motor side. In the spinal cord, these are the topics that we will cover. The central nervous consists of the brain and spinal cord. Nerves that send signals out to the body or receive sensory input from the body are part of the peripheral nervous system. The spinal cord is a cylindrical structure that is continuous with the brain's medulla oblongata terminating at the end of the spinal cord known as the conus medullaris. The end of the spinal cord occurs at the lower region of the first lumbar vertebrae, where it had tapered to a point called this conus medullaris. The spinal cord is protected by the stacked vertebrae forming the vertebral column. In addition, meninges, or layers around the spinal cord, offer additional protection. Cerebral spinal fluid is made in the brain and flows down through the spinal cord and back to the brain again via the outside of the spinal cord. This surrounding fluid within the meninges also serve as a form of protection to the spinal cord. The width of the spinal cord is about one centimeter, except in two regions where it expands to about a centimeter and a half. These regions are the cervical and lumbar regions where the spinal nerves that innervate the upper and lower limbs originate. Spinal and cranial nerves form the peripheral nervous system. The paired cranial nerves extend from the brain, while the spinal nerves extend outward from the spinal cord. These spinal nerves project through the holes or foramen along the both sides of the vertebral column. These nerves are named for the regions they come from and are numbered in sequence as you go down the spinal cord based on which adjacent vertebrae they protrude outward from. There are eight from the cervical region, 12 from the thoracic region, five from the lumbar region, five from the sacral region, and one coccygeal nerve to make a total of 31 pair of spinal nerves. Note that the spinal cord ends at L1. However, nerves from the end of the spinal cord continue inside the vertebral space, and these nerves maintain the sequence by extending outward to the body through the holes between the vertebrae. The spinal nerves are named for where they exit the vertebral column, not where they originate on the spinal cord itself. The bundle of nerves extending within the vertebral canal from the end of the spinal cord is called the cauda equina, which means horse's tail. These spinal nerves are contained within the vertebral canal, then become part of the peripheral nervous system as they extend laterally through the intervertebral foramen at regular intervals. They are named for the location that they exit at. Surrounding the brain and spinal cord are three protective layers called meninges. The outermost layer, just under the bones of the skull or the vertebral column, is called dura mater. In Latin, that means tough mother. Deep to the dura mater is the arachnoid mater. In Greek, arachini means spider. The arachnoid mater has a fibrous or web-like appearance. The fibrous structure of this layer allows for the fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, to travel outside of the brain and spinal cord. The innermost layer, pia mater, in Latin it means delicate mother, lies directly on the surface of the brain and spinal cord. Its purpose is to insulate the central nervous system from the components of the cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid is made within the chambers or spaces inside the brain. This fluid from within the brain travels down a small channel in the center of the spinal cord, then out the bottom around the cauda equina. This fluid then travels back up the outside of the spinal cord in the space within the fibers of the arachnoid mater. The meninges mark clinically defined boundaries. 
The epidural space is outside of the dura mater, while subdural space is under the dura mater and within the bounds of the central nervous system. The subarachnoid space is the space within the arachnoid mater that is the scaffolding web-like portion that cerebral spinal fluid flows up through as it goes up towards the brain for reabsorption. When a sample of cerebral spinal fluid is required from a patient, a lumbar puncture known as a spinal tap is performed. This is when a needle is inserted into the space below the end of the spinal cord, below L1 or L2. This needle insertion is ideally done between L3 and L4. The needle is pressed through the dense ligaments of the vertebral column, then pushed past the resistance of the dura mater and into the subdural space. At this time, the needle is in the region of the cauda equina where the potential for damage is significantly less by not having a solid mass of spinal cord to be punctured. Within this subarachnoid space, cerebral spinal fluid can be drawn into the syringe. One common anesthesia procedure is commonly referred to as an epidural. This procedure is performed at the specific level that pain reduction is required. A needle is again inserted through the dense ligaments of the vertebral column, but not past the dura mater. Once the needle is through the ligaments and into the space above the dura mater, which is often filled with fat, the anesthetic is injected. This will reduce the sensory nerve impulses to the brain, thus numbing the regions that is innervated at this level and inferiorly beyond. The spinal cord itself is made up of white matter and gray matter. From top to bottom, there are variations in these regions, but the main composition is that the gray matter is in the central portion in a butterfly shape while surrounded by the white matter. The butterfly shape of gray matter has a pointy side, which is posterior, and usually extends to the edge. This is where sensory information from the periphery enters the spinal cord. The more rounded anterior side is where motor commands exit the spinal cord. In some regions of the spinal cord, you can see a mid-bulge point that represents the lateral horn, which is also an area that commands the body, but this region is specific to involuntary movements, while the anterior horn is specific to control skeletal muscles or voluntary movement. White matter tracts or groups of common axons are clustered together to either go upward to the brain these are known as afferent tracts, which relay sensory information to the brain, or down from the brain. These groups of axons are known as efferent tracts, and they bring commands to the body to cause some physiological response. We can see in this picture the ascending and descending, or afferent and efferent tracts going through the spinal cord and up to or from the brain. For sensory information, the impulse starts from a sensory receptor such as pain or touch. Stimulation of the sensory neuron enters the posterior portion of the spinal cord and then continues upward to the brain. When an action is dictated by the brain, the impulse travels down the white matter tract to the appropriate spinal cord segment and that, that the action should take place and the action potential goes to the motor neuron to exit the spinal cord to go out to the target. This shows some of the groups of tracts in the white matter for both sensory and motor. Clinically understanding this mapping is crucial to understanding the limitations of a patient with specific spinal cord damage. The gray matter portion deep within the spinal cord is divided into different sections. The posterior horn is where you can find the ends of sensory neurons, so this region contains the axon's terminals of sensory neurons bringing information toward the central nervous system, or afferent neurons. The lateral gray horns contain dendrites and cell bodies of autonomic involuntary neurons. The anterior horns contain the dendrites and cell bodies for motor neurons. Between the two sides across the middle is the gray commissure. 
axons that cross over from one side to the other are found in this region. In the very center is a small hole called the central canal, which is where cerebral spinal fluid comes down from the spaces within the brain. Sensory and motor neurons enter or exit the spinal cord as spinal roots. These rootlets form the spinal nerves that exit through the intervertebral foramen on either side of the vertebral column. The posterior dorsal spinal roots bring afferent or sensory information into the spinal cord. The anterior ventral roots send out motor commands. They fuse together to become spinal nerves. Spinal nerves are considered to be mixed nerves because they contain both sensory and motor neurons. Neurons all have dendrites that receive information, a cell body, an axon to transmit action potentials, and finally axon terminals to send neurotransmitters to another cell, a neuron or tissue. The configuration of motor, sensory, and interneurons are slightly different from each other. Sensory neurons have their cell body off to the side, off from the axon. The motor neuron has a cell body and dendrites together at one end with the axon terminal at the other end. Interneurons are short connector type of neurons that are found throughout the central nervous system. The anterior and posterior nerve roots contain axons. The anterior nerve roots in green or ventral roots contain axons of motor neurons. In blue, the posterior Dorsal nerve roots contain axons of sensory neurons. Notice on the posterior surface in the light blue is this enlarged area. This is called the dorsal root ganglion. This contains the cell bodies of sensory neurons. We can see that a little better here with a drawing of the sensory neuron in blue where we see the dendrites where a sensory receptor would be, the axon coming in towards through the spinal nerve, dividing posteriorly to the dorsal root. The cell bodies are lumped and clustered in this dorsal root ganglion. The axon for the sensory neuron continues into the spinal cord into that posterior horn. On the anterior horn, we can see the cell body and dendrites for a green motor neuron, and the axon for that motor neuron leaves the ventral root and eventually merges with the spinal nerve where it's mixed, where we have both sensory and motor. The neural pathway for motor or efferent neurons begin in the brain. The impulse travels down the spinal cord in the white matter, down a descending tract, at the spinal segment where the motor activities that take place, the neuron will synapse onto another neuron. The synapse takes place in the gray matter. The gray matter is where the axon terminals from the first neuron synapse onto the dendrites or cell body of the second neuron. The second neuron's axon will exit the spinal cord via the ventral root going out to the muscle to be activated. The neural pathway for sensory or afferent neuron begins in the periphery. For example, touching your finger against a hot surface would stimulate the temperature sensory receptors, bringing the impulse toward the spinal cord via the spinal nerve, then to the dorsal root and into the posterior horn of the spinal cord. Within the posterior horn, the axon terminal of the sensory neuron will release its neurotransmitter onto a second neuron whose axon will send the impulse upward via one of the ascending tracks to the brain. So looking at the spinal cord cross-section, it's clear we have the gray and white matter. The white matter is going to be just axons, most of which have myelin, and that's what gives it the white appearance. The gray matter are going to be dark stained, and that's where we find the cell bodies, dendrites, or axon terminal, so this is where a synapse will take place. The dorsal root is going to be where we have the axons for sensory nerves, where the ventral root is the axons for motor nerves. And then dorsal root ganglia are the cell bodies for the sensory nerves. So here's a list with a color coding diagram of the features of the spinal cord that you need to identify. You should also know the 
portion of the neuron, whether it's motor or sensory, whether it's an axon or dendrite or cell body or axon terminal, where those are located. This diagram may help identify those parts of a neuron in these regions of the spinal cord. At this point, you should be comfortable naming the meninges, knowing what their texture is, knowing the spaces between the meninges as know the spaces between the meninges as well as where you can find cerebral spinal fluid. You should know about the sections or regions of the spinal cord, where enlargements take place, what the roots are, the motor and the sensory, meaning the ventral and dorsal, as well as the distal end components of the spinal cord. You should know on cross-section anatomy the regions of the spinal cord and what neuron parts are in each region, and you should understand what gray and white matter are composed of. Spinal nerves, these are the mixed nerves coming off the spinal cord. They are mixed nerves because they are made up of afferent sensory and efferent or motor axons. The spinal nerves begin at the point that the dorsal and ventral roots merge and become one. So we've talked about the spinal cord, which is part of the central nervous system. We are now moving over to the peripheral nervous system and specifically talking about the spinal nerves. There are three layers of connective tissue that help isolate and protect the axons within the spinal nerves and subsequent branches. The outermost layer that surrounds the entire nerve is the epineurium. Inside the spinal nerve axons are grouped together based on function and region of innervation. These groups or bundles of axons are surrounded by the perineurium, which separates them from adjacent bundles. The innermost layer that surrounds a single axon is the endoneurium. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves that come off the spinal cord, 8 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 sacral, and 1 coccygeal. Dermatomes are portions of the skin that are innervated by each of the 31 pairs of spinal nerves. There is a specific mapping with some overlap of adjacent regions that correspond to each spinal nerve. In the event of damage to the spinal cord, knowing the segments of skin associated with each spinal nerve would help to quickly identify the area of damage. Spinal nerves that go to our limbs form a web-like network called a plexus. There are four plexuses. The only spinal nerves that are not associated with a plexus are the second through 11th thoracic nerves you will need to know which spinal nerves contribute to each of the four plexuses. And you should know where those plexuses serve as well as specific nerves that we will go through. For the cervical plexus, the cervical plexus utilizes the spinal nerves C1 through C5. Its most important nerve that you need to know is the phrenic nerve. This phrenic nerve goes all the way down to control the diaphragm and breathing. The diaphragm is a large, thin muscle that separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal pelvic cavity. It has a large expanse, so the fibers that control the diaphragm come from C3, C4, and C5 specifically within the cervical plexus. Therefore, spinal cord injuries above C3 are fatal because you cannot control the diaphragm at all and breathing will stop. Spinal cord injuries within C3, 4, or 5 will require some breathing assistance for the patient if they survive. The brachial plexus. It comes from spinal nerves C5 and T1. So notice there's an overlap between the cervical and brachial plexus with C5. It contributes to both. This is a web-like of nerves that's coming down from the neck and across the shoulder region. There are five main nerves that serve the upper limb that you need to know their names and their region of innervation. We can see the brachial plexus here has these main subdivisions, root, trunks, divisions, 
of this web. You do not need to know them. I just wanted to make you aware of some of the details that the brachial plexus includes. For the purpose of our class, you just need to know the spinal nerve roots in green, and then you'll need to know the important nerves that are listed here. Here's a more detailed view of the brachial plexus, and these are the nerves coming off of them that, that we'll discuss. We can see them color-coded in this image here, as well as a color coding of the regions that those nerves innervate. The axillary nerve shown in red wraps posteriorly behind the humerus and wraps coming anteriorly. Its job is to control the muscle, known as the deltoid muscle, and teres minor. Specifically, it helps to lift your arm up and away from the body, or abduct your arm. It also contributes to the sensations of the skin over the shoulder. The musculocutaneous nerve goes down the humerus and down towards the radius. The main function that I want you to know that it does is it controls the biceps brachii, brachialis, and coracobrachialis. Since we haven't learned the muscles yet, I want you to be aware that its job is to flex the forearm or to bend your elbow, lifting something as if you were to lift something up like a barbell. It also has the sensations we can see in the image on the right, the skin over the lateral forearm, but it innervates the muscle of your biceps, is what most people are most familiar with. The radial nerve goes behind the humerus and down the arm. It's named for the bone in the forearm that it runs along, which is the radius. It's on the thumb side of your forearm. Its job is to innervate the muscles essentially on the back of your arm, whether it's your upper arm or your forearm. So its job is extension, either pulling your arm back away behind you or in an anatomical position, it will move your hand rotating at the wrist posteriorly, but because it also goes to the lateral side along the radius, it will rotate your wrist outward. So moving your, rotate your hand outward at the wrist. The median nerve is named because it goes right between the two bones of your forearm. Its job is to flex your wrist, which means if you're in anatomical position with your palms forward and you bend at the wrist, bringing your fingers and rotate, fingers anteriorly rotating your hands up and forward as if you're going to hold something in your hand. That would be flexion at the wrist. It's also involved in the sensations in the palm of your hand. We can see the muscles the median nerve innervates as well as the sensory area on the palm. The ulnar nerve, most people are familiar with this because it's also known as your funny bone. So obviously it's not a bone, but notice how the ulnar nerve goes right behind that medial projection on your humerus. If you put your finger in between your, the point of your elbow and that medial protrusion, you will find a little dip, and in that dip lies your ulnar nerve, and if you hit that, you can feel sensations go all the way down your medial forearm to your pinky and the medial side of your ring finger. Its function is to do wrist adduction, so again, an anatomical position, rotating at the wrist, if you're tipping your pinky towards your body or towards the midline, that's adduction, as well as controlling your last two digits, your ring finger and your pinky finger, or the obviously sensations in that location. You can see the muscles associated here with the wrist adduction. So in this summary, we can see the axillary nerve in blue, the musculocutaneous, the sensory portion for the musculocutaneous in green, then the radial nerve, we know that serves the entire posterior part of the arm. The medial nerve is going to do the palm of our hands, and we can see our funny bone, the ulnar nerve, doing our medial side and our pinkies, medial side of our forearm and our pinky. The lumbar plexus begins from spinal nerve roots T12 through L4. There are many nerves that are important coming off of the lumbar plexus. 
The image here identifies some of the sensory areas that these, the image here color coded in pink, purple, and blue identify the sensory areas of either the lower abdomen, groin, and anterior thigh that nerves from the lumbar plexus serve. We see here the muscular action portions that the lumbar plexus nerve serves. So the main two for my class, I would like you to be familiar with the femoral nerve, which serves the muscles on the anterior thigh or your quadriceps femoris muscles, as well as the obturator nerve that's serving the adductors. Again, here we can see this is a map more of the sensory areas. So the femoral nerve from the lumbar plexus, it goes to the anterior thigh, its job is to extend your lower leg like you're kicking a ball or lifting your leg up where it's bending at your thigh. So that's flexion at the hip or you have extension at the knee. We can see the sensory regions of the femoral nerve as well as on the right, the femoral nerve identified in blue. The obturator nerve, we can see it's more medial, so it's going to innervate the muscles in the medial thigh, and its job is adduction of thigh, which brings your legs back towards the midline. The sacral plexus comes from spinal nerves L4 through S4. The important nerves are the gluteal nerves and pudendal nerves, but we're gonna really focus on the main and biggest nerve in our body, the sciatic nerve, as well as its tributaries, the peroneal or fibular and the tibial nerve. So this is a lateral view of the sacral plexus. We can see them coming together to form this really large sciatic nerve, as well as we can see some of the other smaller branches, the superior inferior gluteal, as well as the pudendals. The sciatic nerve that is gonna be our primary focus innervates the areas highlighted in green. We can see in yellow the sciatic nerve quite prominently as it comes off the gluteal region. In the buttock or gluteal region, we can see that it's traveling under a muscle that happens to be the piriformis muscle. It's on the back side of the leg, so it's going on the posterior side of the femur as well as the posterior side of the tibia. The sciatic nerve at the level just around behind your knee, so in the popliteal region, will divide into a lateral segment called the peroneal nerve, also known as the fibular nerve. The tibial nerve will continue down posteriorly and remains in blue, as we can see. The peroneal nerve serves the lateral side of your lower leg, while the tibial nerve serves the hamstrings and the calf muscles in that lower leg. Oftentimes, the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus get combined and are referred to as the lumbosacral plexus. We will just keep them divided. You will know the lumbar plexus and the nerve roots from that plexus, as well as these two main nerves, what they do and their regions of innervation. For the sacral plexus, you should know that it comes from L4 to S4. You are responsible for the main nerve being the sciatic nerve, as well as its two tributaries and where they innervate. So for spinal nerves, you should know the number of spinal nerves that we have, the types of neurons that make up a spinal nerve, the motor and the sensory, as well as that, that neuron's anatomy. You should know about the connective tissue layers around the nerves. You should know what dermatomes are and how they're related to the spinal nerves. And you should be able to identify what spinal nerves serve each of the four plexuses and know the major nerves and what they do in each plexus. In our last section, we're gonna talk about spinal reflexes, which puts together these peripheral nerves and the spinal cord. Spinal reflexes are mediated by the spinal cord and not the brain. They are somatic reflexes that involve the skeletal muscle or autonomic reflexes that affect smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or glandular secretions. We will discuss specific somatic reflexes here. Autonomic reflexes will be addressed in the autonomic nervous system chapter. Sensory input for the somatic reflexes are initiated by pain, 
rapid stretch, excessive force, etc. This stimulates a skeletal muscle response. This response is involuntary, although it's happening to a voluntary muscle that under normal conditions would only contract from stimulation originating in the brain. Somatic reflex is an involuntary response to a stimulus. If it's pain, the sensory nerve ending sends an action potential along the axon to enter the posterior horn of the spinal cord. A motor neuron will be stimulated whose action potential exits via the ventral roots and out to a skeletal muscle to remove the body from the painful stimulus. In more detail, the process begins with a sensory pain receptor, known as a nociceptor. Then the afferent or sensory neuron that is activated follow the spinal cord to the dorsal roots of the posterior horn of the spinal cord. A synapse is made onto an interneuron reaching from the posterior horn to the anterior horn where the inner neuron will synapse with a motor neuron. This activated motor neuron will send its impulse out of the spinal cord via the ventral root to the spinal nerve and ultimately to the effector muscle that will move the hand away from the pain source. The reflex arc is shown again in this diagram. Begin with the pin prick to the finger and the sensory neuron in blue, the interneuron is in yellow and the motor neuron back out is in green. It's important to note that the sensory neuron will also synapse onto a neuron in the ascending tract of the white matter to relay the signal of the pain or other stimulus to the brain. Thus, a person will receive information about the stimulus, pain for example. The information will be where in the body it is occurring, an assessment of damage or type of pain inflicted, etc. The cognition or awareness of the painful event will take place at the same time or after the body part has been removed from the stimulus. A person has moved their hand before they even realize what is happening. That is the mechanism of the reflex, to elicit a movement without a conscious thought to do so. These are the different types of somatic reflexes. The Golgi tendon reflex, stretch reflex, withdrawal reflex, crossed extensor, Babinski, corneal, and abdominal. The stretch reflex starts from a sensory receptor that's a mu known as a muscle spindle, and it's in the belly of a muscle. When there is rapid stretch of a muscle, so if you were to strike, use a reflex hammer and strike a tendon, the hitting of that tendon will cause elongation of the muscle, which is detected by this muscle spindle. The elongation of the muscle spindle then sends a signal to the spinal cord and then out to the contractile elements of the muscle causing muscle shortening. The clinical purpose of a reflex is to evaluate the pathway from a specific body region to the spinal cord and back out again. So you can, knowing the areas that specific nerves innervate and where those nerves originate on the spinal cord, by doing a stretch reflex of a number of muscles throughout the body can tell you if there is damage at a certain level of the spinal cord. The stretch reflex of the biceps tendon tells you if C5 to C6 is okay, the triceps tendon reflex tells you if C6 to C8 is okay, and so on. So we can see that just doing these specific reflexes help to identify if those regions of the spinal cord are functioning. So some additional sensory reflexes include the corneal reflex. This actually tests cranial nerve number five and number seven. So cranial nerve number five brings the sensation to the brain that your eye has been touched by something. And then cranial nerve number seven controls the mu muscles that will close your eyelid to protect your eye. So this assesses two different nerves as well as those regions of the brain simply by just touching an object or a corner of a paper to an eye. In the abdominal superficial reflex, you can test it by touching different regions of the abdomen to test these segments of the spinal cord. The Golgi tendon reflex we see here, we see motor axons going to the muscles of the forearm. 
the Golgi tendon reflex says tendon. So it's actually sensing muscular stress or strain at the level of the tendon. Some people are so muscular that the force that their muscles, and in this case the forearm, can produce is likely to cause damage to their tendons or bones. So this reflex prevents you from hurting yourself. So sensations of excessive force are being sent up to the spinal cord, to the sensory region, connects across through an interneuron to the motor muscles and tells them to stop. So this reflex actually senses damage, but it causes an inhibition of muscular action. And the person's hand will then relax. The withdrawal reflex, we've discussed this one previously, there's a pain receptor, and in order to prevent tissue damage, we send a neuron impulse back to the posterior spinal cord, across, out the anterior spinal cord, to the muscle itself, causes the muscle to contract so that you can lift your hand away. A withdrawal with a crossed extensor. So in this example, we have this person. So we have a foot stepping on a sharp pin. That will elicit a pain stimulus going to the back of the spinal cord, and then it'll cross over, and it will not only tell your muscle of the side of your body that's stepping on the pin to lift your leg up, but it also tells your opposite side oh, I think you need to brace and contract because I need to put my weight on this side. And so the reason why this is called a crossed extensor is it's activating muscles on both sides of the spinal cord. For spinal reflexes, you should know the different reflexes that there are. For each reflex, know the stimulus and the effect. The three main ones you need to be aware of are the stretch reflex, the Golgi tendon reflex, the withdrawal reflex, and the crossed extensor reflex, as well as the function of each reflex. Why are we bothering to test these or what is their purpose?